I didn't know that I was going to be seeing so many professionals here. So it is kind of geared to students, but um, I will just, you know, present it the way that um, I um, have planned and um, hope that you enjoy what I am stressing in the next couple of minutes anyway. Okay, so I'm going to start out welcoming all of you and thanking uh, the students who have um, recommended that I share this lecture. It is an honor and a privilege, um, which is what I feel every time that I uh, get into a classroom at FSCJ. So uh, I'm going to start out by uh, just sharing my um, presentation now. Okay. All right. I called it writing about the other side of the world because um, I had been challenged, and you can see our world out there, and I hope I am not going to make you dizzy <laughs> while I scroll. It's a big world, and we're just such a tiny, tiny part of it. And yet, through writing, this world gets smaller and smaller, and we're able to um, reach out and learn about the lives of other people. So my challenge as a writing teacher is that I, I know that ENC 1101 and 1102 are required for most students. So I don't have a group of students, a group of you sitting in the classroom with me because you chose the class. Um, and that is a challenge because I want to make the class as exciting and as interesting as possible. And I thought, well, if it's interesting to me, it's probably going to be interesting to my students. Um, so that is where I started. Um, it is required. It's comprised of lots of different interests and learning styles. Every one of the classes that I have have a broad range. So how do I reach all those students? And um, last but not least, it's focused on writing. And um, writing terrors are so contagious. <laughs> uh, and I see them in my class all the time. Um, how do I calm people down? How do I get them interested and engaged? And how do I present something more than just writing. Um, we can talk about nouns and verbs and, and sentence fragments, but all that is, is tangential to the subject matter. So we all have to choose as writing teachers what we're going to focus on. Um, and here's basically what I was um, just reviewing about engaging all students. And then I found out through my readings, as you probably have too, those of you who've done research about education, employers are looking for globally sensitive students. They want students who are more aware of the things going on in the world and in different cultures um, than just here in their own locale where they've been born and raised. So that was a challenge for me. Staying current was also a challenge. But by that, I mean that um, when I'm thinking about what is going to appeal to my students, I'm thinking about the median range of age and I'm looking at how um, students are thinking these days, which is kind of a, a you know, like a stretch for somebody who's old. <laughs> but my students keep me young. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking to them. Uh, what are you interested in? Um, I'm looking to reach diverse populations and learning styles. I'm looking to enhance writing skills, but I want that to be I want something more than that. At the same time, I want to give students something that they're excited about, that they actually go back to their uh, fellow students and families and say, guess what I'm learning? Um, and I found that in da, 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 the memoir. Um, the memoir is a as an important part of literature as far as I'm concerned, because it is the way people share their lives or part of their lives. Um, and just for the benefit of those who may not know, it's not a novel. It's not something that is fictitious. It's not. It's nonfiction, and it's narrated by the author in first person. Um, you're getting thoughts, feelings, reactions, events, mm -hmm. um, and you're invited into the memoirist world. And that I think is one of the most important um, parts of teaching across the world. Uh, you are getting to know somebody who's been brought up in a culture totally different from what you've seen. 
and experienced and somebody um, who can share what life is like. Um, I think Linda Fouquet um, says what I believe about the memoir and it, it talks more about the whole person. How am I educating students, not just um, in writing skills, but in other ways of thinking and feeling and maturing? Uh, so this is what she says. Every time I read a memoir, I'm reminded of their power to connect us to something beyond ourselves. A memoir invites us to step into a life and an experience that are not ours. And because we cannot claim that experience as our own, it exposes us to a different and possibly broader perspective. It's that broader perspective and different experience that is so important for us. And I feel in today's day, it is. With everything that's going on in the world, um, it is a time when students need to be able to find something that is concrete that they believe in and that they they trust is going to guide them and lead them um, in a very insecure world, a very unsure world. Um, the benefits of an intercultural classroom. I'm moving to this just so that I can uh, cover the idea that that learning about global affairs, learning about what's going on in different parts of the world is um, is something that is being recognized everywhere. And I found this um, in an, an AFS program um, document. Education, according to Ban Ki Moon, gives us the chance to understand that we are all tied together as citizens of the global community and that our challenges are interconnected. I think it's so important now that we come together. I think that's a uniting um, message that we've been hearing. And so this makes it current because we're we're looking at ways to uh, find what our similar our similarities are instead of always looking towards differences. Um, intercultural competence helps students become more empathetic and flexible. So the competence comes when um, my students look at the memoir that they're reading and they all of a sudden realize, wait, this is a person like me. And what if I was going through that? What would I do in those circumstances? Um, the empathy is there and then the flexibility. I'm thinking in terms of things that are outside of my realm of experience. So that's another good reason for the memoir. And finally, global classrooms, and I don't know why this keeps on coming up. <laughs> global classrooms help prepare schools to be more collaborative in their communities. So what I'd like to look at is where my students are going after college and what kinds of people and citizens they're going to be. I think that, um, the perspectives that you get through memoirs um, really help students to uh, to step out of themselves and become broader and better citizens. So I have three memoirs that I'm going to be sharing with you. And my first is called In Order to Live, and it's by Yeonmi Park. Okay, she is a North Korean, uh, born and raised in North Korea. So you hear I, I have a little dot on the map of where actually that's that's the entire Korean Peninsula but look how far it is from us we're here she's there and she was born and raised in the northern uh, part of Korea in Haisan I'm going to get to her her uh, biographical statistics which was right on the border of China and something that is not listed here even though it's teeny tiny uh, where she lived, she could actually look over the river and see China across the Tumen River. Also in that corner near Mount Pektu, there is a, a portion of Russia. So Russia and China are right on her borders and that gives us a perspective of what we're going to see in her life. She was born in 1993. You're gonna see that all of my memoirs, unfortunately they're all written by women. I did have a few by men, but um, they're not current. What I am looking for is to find somebody about the same age as my students. So that's what I was looking into. Um, she was born in 1993 in Haisan, 
And here are some of the cultural beliefs that we learn through her writing. Yeonmi um, taught us that men are superior in North Korea. They are allowed to beat their wives. They actually have their own um, set of eating utensils. And if they desire, they, um, they are not, um, they can choose not to eat with um, their female uh, family members. Uh, the beating of the wives was, was really strange. There's actually a, a part of the, of the memoir that says that she, that her father and mother came to, came to blows <laughs> over another woman. Um, but that is an interesting part. She says when she get when she finally was free and she went into a training in South Korea where she had to kind of reprogram her mind, they taught them, um, no, you're not allowed to hit. No more hitting, uh, no more beating up. That's just not acceptable. The North Korean regime is something that a lot of students already know about, but they don't know the kinds of things that have gone on over the past 70 plus years. And the regime back under uh, Kim Il-sung came up with three different, uh, the broadest uh, categories of the class system known as Songbun. It's the core, and those were all the people who were loyal to the North Korean cause during the war. The wavering, their loyalty might be questionable. Um, and so they're kind of not, uh, not in the best position with the leadership of North Korea. And then there's the hostile, and that's the category that uh, Yomi Park and her family fell into. Um, these are the people who fought against um, Kim Il-sung in the Korean War. They were also landowners, and of course, that was a bad thing when Kim Il-sung took over. He, he instituted a uh, community uh, landowning system and uh, distributed land according to the people who were favorites of his. They also uh, dictate whether you can go to college. Um, most of the hostels can't. Uh, and if you do go to college, what you're going to major in. And it's usually something that the, the government can use your services doing. So that is the way that your life is shaped. There is no religion. In fact, they worship the dear leader. Um, there have been three since the beginning of North Korea, and they were Kim Il-sung, family members all, the, the grandfather. He reigned the longest. Kim Jong-il, 1994 to 2011, and Kim Jong-un, whom we well know because he's the present leader. Um, so that is what the system was like. What happened to Yeonmi herself? There is no way that you can make a living in North Korea if you are in the hostel classes and uh, you have a family to support. So there is a lot of illegal trading going on, and that is what Yomi Park's father ended up doing. He was reported, he was arrested, he was imprisoned. And the way that they tortured him was by continually beating um, a certain part of his back and hip and leg area. Um, he couldn't even walk uh, because it was it, he had nerve damage. As a result, her father ended up getting cancer and, um, and dying. Uh, but that is not the part of, of, the, of the memoir that I'm talking about right now. Uh, they were starving, they had no income. And they were, they were told, this is Yonmi, her other family members were her mother and her sister, Unmi. They were told that the women could escape by going over that river into China and they would be able to get employed and they'd be able to make money and then they'd be able to come back and get the father. So that was the plan. Um, they were very naive in, in hearing um, that information because it wasn't true. Um, and what ended up happening that was as soon as they went over the river they were bought by human traffickers and they spent, and this, what I'm saying, they, I mean, Yomi and her mother, her sister went over sooner and they couldn't um, find her. 
So for seven years, um, they were looking for her. But Yomi and her mother ended up going over and then immediately being sold into human slavery and uh, being raped and abused. At the time, Yomi Park was 13 years old. China has plays a good, a big part in the problem for North Korean refugees because they do not recognize North Korean any North Korean as a uh, as a refugee. If they did, if they obeyed the international laws that they've signed, they would allow them to be refugees. In refugee status involves having a having papers and being able to work. But um, these people, especially the women, um, were called illegal migrants. If they were caught, they were sent back to North Korea where they were imprisoned and tortured or put to death. So at this point, uh, Yomi Park and her mother have no hope. Um, another thing about being a woman in China is that because of the one child policy, I don't know if some of you know this, but in the 1980s, China decided they had too many people and they made it a, um, a crime to have more than one child. Many little girls were either adopted out or put to death. And uh, so they ended up now in this day and age having more men than women. And uh, the women uh, coming over from North Korea are the perfect um, slave brides. And that is one of the reasons why the, the government of China lets this go on. So at 13 years old, at 60 pounds, Yomi and her mother were both sold to Chinese men who repeatedly raped them and sold them to others. I'm not going to go into the entire memoir, but for two years, they have absolutely no hope. They don't know how to get out of the situation. Um, eventually, a missionary group takes them in and smuggles them out of China into Mongolia, and that is the circuitous route that they have to go through in order to get to South Korea where they're granted citizenship. Um, at 15, Yomi had a second grade invita invitation, education, uh, but at the first taste of freedom she studied, she completed college in South Korea. She goes on and uh, she's actually a Columbia University law graduate and a wife and a mother today. Um, so we see how she does this and she changes, um, when all hope was gone, she just was, uh, steadfast in believing that she could, she could do it if she just tried hard enough. And so what do, what, what do my students learn when, um, we study Yomi Park, um, courage, inner strength, hope, resilience. All of the kinds of things that that they need right now in a COVID environment where they're not sure what they're going to be uh, be able to do. If they're going to be able to get a job, uh, having trouble with education. They're having trouble with job um, security. Uh, but the other things that you learn from Yonmi Park is the desire to help others. Um, of course, compassion, community service, because she goes in at the age of uh, 17, 18 years old, she goes into other countries and starts telling people what's going on in North Korea. She had, uh, she was on a death or a kill list by the North Korean government. And she declared, I don't care if I'm killed at this point, because at least I've been able to tell my story and I've been able to help my North Korean people. All right. If you have questions as we go through this, please feel free to uh, ask them. I think I can see them. Not sure if I can. All right, I'm going to go on to my second uh, memoir, and it's called "The Last Girl" by Nadia uh, Nadia Murad. All right, this is an interesting story. Last August, after I had um, selected all of my books for ENC 1102, I'm sitting and watching. 60 minutes and I see Nadia Murad come on and tell her story and instantly I jumped up and I canceled my books and I said, well, I want to teach that. 
had never been in before, but I wanted to, I thought it was such a wonderful uh, part of, of the world to know about and to care about. Uh, the last girl, uh, Nadia Murad, born in uh, Kocho, Iraq. Mm, okay. Um, a poor village, and it was generally considered a part of Kurdistan. Now, to go into the details of uh, how Iraq is divided into people who are Kurds, Sunni, Muslims, Shia government, and then what uh, Nadi Murad is, is a Yazidi. It's it's very complicated, and yet the way that she presents it, it's it it just gives you a wealth of knowledge about what is going on in that country, and the history of the country. So here you see the one little part, um, right over here, this red mark, uh, which is where we're gonna what we're gonna be talking about. As a Yazidi, Yazidi, Murad um, explains this as an ancient monotheistic religion spread orally by holy men entrusted with our stories. The problem is that they're peace-loving, they're very family-oriented people, uh, they like to maintain their, their customs and their traditions, they wouldn't hurt a fly, and yet they're hated because they're different. And what a, what a lesson this starts to um, build in those who are reading her story because we're thinking, how many times does this happen in, in human um, history where a small group is, is um, just persecuted because of what they believe? And, and there are reasons, political reasons, why there was jealousies against the Yazidis, but the Yazidis have been um, struck by other groups throughout their entire 2,000-year history. So here... Um, this young woman at the age of 20 is in her village of Kocho. Uh, she has, uh, because of the family structure, she has lots and lots of brothers and half brothers and half sisters because um, her father was able to take uh, multiple wives. And uh, they all love each other. And they all get together for family time. Um, and uh, what she tells us about uh, being a Yazidi is that that comes first. She doesn't consider herself a, an Iraqi. It would be like we would be um, uh, identifying more with a group that we belong to than uh, the state of Florida or the um, United States. She says this, religion blends into ethnicity. Most Kurds, for instance, are Sunni Muslim, but their Kurdish identity comes first. Many Yazidis consider Yazidism both an ethnic and a religious identity. So it's a very different way of thinking. It's, it's important though to know that part of the story um, when you look at what happened to this village in 2014. It was genocide. ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria declared a caliphate in 2014 and it was ordered by its leader to take over the land um, that they could and claim it for their own state. They were trying to institute their own property, their own nation um, in Iraq and in Syria. So they chose the weakest parts, the people that didn't defend themselves, the people that didn't have outside loyalties or political parties to help them, and uh, they attacked the village of Kocho. They came up with a, clan, a plan rather, to kill all Yazidis because they considered them infidels. Um, Yazidis had to either convert or they died. Uh, and there was a mass extermination. Well, what happened to Nadia and her family? Here is the family. Nadia is down at the bottom right. And you can see some of the extended family here. That's her brother and her sister-in-law. and. Her niece, actually, who's just five years younger, um, they all look very um, happy, connected. What happened to them, though, was horrific. Um, after surrounding the, the town for two weeks in August, all of the people were then commanded to go into the school in Kocho, and the women and children were taken to the second floor, the men to the first floor. 
they were all robbed of their possessions. And all of the women, I mean, all of the men over 12 years old were, were taken out and killed and uh, thrown into a mass grave. Um, 800 men died um, that day. Women were stripped of all their jewelry, their money. They were taken slaves into Mosul, Iraq. Um, girls as young as nine years old were taken to be what they called sabia or um, wives, concubines. Uh, Natalie herself, or Nadia herself rather, spent two months and she tells us about some of the things that happened to her. Um, it's not easy to talk about these things, but I think it's important because human trafficking takes place all over the world, um, even in our own communities. But in this case, these are the things that happened to the women that I don't think that we're aware of. Uh, she was burned with cigarettes, she was beaten, she was gang raped for trying to escape. And eventually she did um, get out. And what did she find when she was released two months later? That her mother had been killed, six of her brothers had been killed, Two of her brothers had survived, but they were so badly injured and still hospitalized months later, um, and they were not able to uh, work after that. What they did was the, with the younger boys was they turned them into ISIS fighters, suicide bombers, um, and her closest uh, friend, Catherine, that you saw in the picture, was blown up by a roadside bomb as she was coming to freedom. Uh, Kocha was completely destroyed, leaving villagers homeless and living in a refugee camp. So, did you hear about it? I don't remember hearing about it. But this massacre got the attention of um, Amal Clooney. Um, this is good because it's a, it's a celebrity. I, I don't think most people know George Clooney. That's the older groups that know him. But um, this is his wife. She's an international barrister, and she befriended um, Nadia and and brought her case to the United Nations Security Council, and is still attempting to arrest and uh, charge the people in ISIS because they know who they are with crimes against humanity. I don't know how this woman was able to go on, but she came out of her bondage mad, mad at what had happened. And she has been working tirelessly to reunite her, her people and uh, to speak out about the um, atrocities of ISIS. And this is what Amal Clooney says about her. So I'll leave you with this. This is the kinds of things that my students are just, um, just so impressed with. There is no doubt ISIS tried to silence Nadia when they kidnapped and enslaved her, raped and tortured her, and killed seven members of her family in a single day. All right, oop, it goes on, there's more. But Nadia refused to be silenced. She has defied all labels that have uh, that life have given her orphan, rape victim, slave, refugee. She has instead created new ones, survivor, Yazidi litter, leader, women's advocate, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. She is also a, a United Nations Goodwill Ambassador, and she goes around and she's raising money to restore her village of of Kocho and to help people. Um, the thing about um, about titles, I always want students to be uh, very aware of a title. And when I'm reading this book for the first time, I'm thinking, what does the last girl mean anyway? Here it is. Um, Nadia herself says more than anything else, this is what her life is dedicated to. I want to be the last girl with a story like mine. So, all right, finally, my third memoir is our um, author series book, um, Michaela de Prince Taking Flight. If you don't know this story, I'm going to tell it to you in a little bit, but 
what happens when we read about these people and they are currently involved in social media is we could go back and follow them on um, Facebook or on their Twitter. In this case, Michaela de Prince has some form that she communicates us to us in. And I'm I'm always happy uh, to get to know the author a little bit better. That's what I also urge my students to do. So here she is, if you don't know who she is, it's called the, the subtitle of the book, Taking Flight is From War Orphan to Ballerina. And there you see her on the cover. She was born <laughs> Mabinti Bangura in Kenema, Sierra Leone, Africa. Um, January 6, 1995. So you get to see that these ladies are all about the same age. Oh, I've got the, the map coming up here. Okay, where's Sierra Leone? Okay. It is in Africa, it's on the Western coast and you can see the little red dot here, maybe. And this is a, a blown up area where you'll see um, the, the, the coastline and uh, the border with Guinea and Liberia. Um, one of the things about Sierra Leone is that it's known for its diamonds. And I, there was a, a, a Leonardo DiCaprio movie out about 10 or more years ago called Blood Diamonds. It's about this country and it's about how um, the diamond um, business um, just fueled rebels uh, at, into a civil war, uh, 1991 to 2002. So you know that, um, let's see, at the, I'm gonna go back to her. There she is. In 1995, the war had been going on for quite a while. Right. Her father was a diamond miner. And if you've ever seen pictures of them there, it's more like panning for gold because that's what they're doing. They're looking actually in the rivers and they're, they're looking for diamonds. Um, and he was killed by members of the Revolutionary United Front. And again, my students learn about the, the different um, factions that were involved during the war during this time, but I'm not gonna go into that, obviously. Here's one of the pictures. What they did was they did very similarly to what ISIS does with young men. They um, indoctrinate them, they take them as children, and they make them killers. Uh, and they killed indiscriminately. They didn't have a, a reason ISIS would kill the Yazidis because they, they didn't believe the same way. But in this case, it was uh, just indiscriminate killing going up and down the country. What happened to three-year-old uh, Mabinti, rather, he was born Mabinti Bangura, uh, was that her mother died and she was left to the care of her uncle Abdullah, who didn't want her. He was a man with 11 children, only one of whom was a male, and, he, and that was the only child he cared about. And because Mabinti had a skin condition called vitiligo, um, she had spots on her skin. He thought she was the devil's child. And that's what he told her continually. He dropped her off at an orphanage with absolutely no intention of ever coming back again. The people at the orphanage also believed that this little girl had something terribly wrong with her and that it was demonic. Um, and they called her the devil's child as well. At the orphanage, uh, she was dead last when it came to getting food, uh, but she was befriended by another girl by the name of B Mabinti, and she was given some extra attention by teacher Sarah. Now, Sarah is an important part of Mabinti's life because Sarah was the teacher who would come in and teach them and give Mabinti extra lessons um, to help her uh, catch up. Uh, but a band of devils, that was the, the word that they used for these um, revolutionaries and devils, um, attacked the teacher. She was leaving after dark. She was pregnant. They cut her open because they wanted to uh, take bets on what her child was, boy or girl. When they found it was a girl, they killed Sarah in front of Mabinti, and they also cut Mabinti's stomach. She would have died if it wasn't for a night watchman at the orphanage dragging her to safety. 
The children in the orphanage then had to escape Sierra Leone into Guinea, and that is uh, when she and her best friend, the other Mabinti, were adopted at four years old by Charles and Elaine de Prince of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <laughs> Mabinti's name was uh, changed to Michaela de Prince, and both Mabinti, both Mabintis, <laughs> were uh, adopted and her friend became Mia de Prince. Here's a little picture of the girls when they were first adopted. The de Princes are, are, are a pretty special um, family. They ended up adopting, uh, I think, nine uh, people, nine children from Africa and uh, around the area. What happened to Michaela, though, was while she was still at the orphanage and under the tutelage of teacher Sarah, she found a picture of a ballerina and she decided that that ballerina was happy. And the only way that she was going to be happy was if she became a ballerina. So here you have this, this little pipsqueak <laughs> who um, is, is adopted by a, a family in New Jersey despite my home state, and she has determined that she is going to be a ballerina as her profession, not just what she does when she's a little girl and all little girls take ballet. No, she is going to become a world-class ballerina, and there she is. She now dances with the Dutch ballet as a soloist. One more thing you should know about Mabinti, and that is the skin condition of vitiligo. This condition and the research that we did together as a class um, was one of the most enlightening conversations that I've ever had with the class about race. Because it is a skin condition, what happens to the, the people that have it is that they lose the melanin, so they, they lose their color, the color of skin. There were people from every walk of life, every ethnicity, every skin color who have this um, condition. And they were talking about their the persecution because of the disease itself. Here's, um, here's a, a picture of Michaela. I never saw it before. She doesn't, she didn't have a lot of pictures in the beginning, but you can see that she's she's got this skin condition. So she has parents who have died. She has an uncle who hates her. She has caretakers at an orphanage who hate her and tell her that this condition is, is because of her. Um, and yet she is able to overcome all of this um, with the love of a family, the support of her other adopted sisters and determination, grit is what, um, we call it, I guess, at FSCJ. Uh, and what is she doing now? Well, she has a blog that I recommend that you go and look at. She tells you about things that are going on in the ballet. She's also an ambassador for War Child uh, for, and helping other war children in the Netherlands because that's where she lives. And this is what I, uh, I thought I'd end with. The... Um, the memoirs always tell us something, but when you look at it as a whole, um, I think the ending of this book is also important. Michaela's asking her mother, Elaine de Prince, um, why did you and daddy adopt? Why didn't you have um, just Eric and Adam? You would have had a lot more money. And her mother replies, well, we were blessed and with blessing comes responsibility. So she thinks about it and she says, well, what's my responsibility? Because she sees that she has been blessed. Her mother responds to share. Well, what am I gonna share? Michaela says, you'll have to figure that out on your own. And that is what Michaela de Prince has been doing since she's been sharing. Um, she says this, I had a responsibility to write the memoir. Writing is a way of sharing. So it all comes full circle to the course itself. It's the way that we learn about other people. Writing is my students' first um, method of uh, applying for a job. 
the the employer doesn't see the person you can put a picture in there but and see how talented the person is it's it's all what you put in writing so we learn from writing about the other side of the world and we learn how to represent ourselves in addition to all the rest of my blessings i had been blessed with a hearty dose of hope isn't that what our students need hope that enabled me to survive in Africa in the face of abuse, starvation, pain, and terrible danger. It was hope that made me dare to dream, and it was hope that helped my dream to take flight. Yes, I would share my hope. And here she is speaking to a group of um, who are interested in the mental health of children. And with that, I am going to um, end. And I'm going to try to get back in to see if there are any questions. Okay, let's see. It is. Oh, I see. I'm sharing. Dr. DeMario, there was a question about um, if, if uh, a couple had twins during the one child policy in the 1980s. And there, there's some articles on it, but, and I don't know if, that, um, if you know the answer to that or not. I actually don't know. I've heard horror stories that, um, that, Twins were either separated um, or only the male child was was kept, but I don't have any documentation. I'm sorry. That's something that we can, you know, that would be a, something we could use when reading the uh, the book in order to live. I would actually give that as an assignment for one of the students to investigate because they do research on the end at the end of the course. Monica. Yeah, the tea girl of Hummingbird Place. They, um, in their particular town or village, they saw twins as like a bad omen, and they killed both oh, of them. Okay. It's and that is you know the ignorance, the cultural backwardness in some places. I don't know, and then the, the governments of these uh, countries. Um, it's. It's it's hard for me to fathom, and let alone I'm I'm taking these young children um, the way that I look at them, my my precious students, um, and they are like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that this existed, uh, but that's what education is all about, and you don't learn just the facts, you learn all of the emotions and the feeling, and um, you know the other things that com comprise a person when you are reading memoirs. So that's one of my, that's just what I do. That's why I do it. And I find, I find it's a goal of mine um, for bringing things that I didn't want to bring up ever in a conversation. They just naturally come to the surface with these, these kinds of, uh, of writings. Um, Monica, this is me. Hi. Hey, I was just going to say, I think one thing that I, I learned by doing this last book with um, Michaela DePrince is we make a lot of cultural assumptions because we apply right. their culture to our culture. But to them, a lot of this stuff is normal. You know, they view women differently. They don't know any different. And I mean, okay. I think it's just hard for us, but it's, it's good for us to understand what some of these countries are going through. But yes. just because they do it a different way doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just it's how it is there. So those yes. little assumptions, I think, is just another interesting angle when you look at other countries and religions and faiths and histories. So. Right. And the people that come out of these, uh, this the same cultures, you know, still have some of the basic human qualities that everybody admires too. I mean, it kind of makes us understand that we're all brothers and sisters. We're all uh, people, um, human beings. Um, so at the same time, you know, you're learning, well, no wonder why they react in such a way because you're getting their, the way that they were brought up, the background, but you see them then as somebody I could friend, somebody that I really like to talk to more. Um, and I think it makes it, like I said, it, it breaks down. I hope it breaks down barriers. I hope it, it gets students and all of us to think more about, um, what we have in common instead of what we don't. 
Anybody else? Dr. Mario, there was a question from Monica Parker. Um, in your course, do you discuss a single memoir or excerpts from several? I just do one, <laughs> one at a time. I and I, but what we do is we take whatever the topic is, and then I have a, a wealth of articles, uh, especially current articles about what's going on in that. Um, if it's human trafficking, then we look at human trafficking across the world. If it's so, yeah, I just take one at a time. Believe it or not, but they get so many other reading assignments because they they have they have the the reading in the book they have uh discussions that is another way that i use writing they have to um look at um other sources analyze them and then talk about them with their um but they're also writing at the same time so they're they practice in writing uh, three four times a week you know um Dr. Damara, I was going to also put a plug in that we have this international global program. Now. Yes. I don't you may yes. have said that, but if you I did were interested it. in that, did you already say it? No, I didn't. I should have. Um, yes, I know. And I think that that's an important part. I mean, because others, other teachers are doing the same thing in different ways in different classes. So, yes, there's an international certificate now that you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can give you the information when I get it. <laughs> if you email me, um, I can give you my email right now. Um, and then anybody who wants to can email me with questions or well, uh, special information. Patty um, McConnell is the contact for that. Thank you. You know that I have internationalized two of my classes for the summer. Have and you? And their speech, well, I haven't done it yet, but I will. Um, and their speech classes. And so we're gonna look at it from a more world view and world problems and things like that on issues to talk about. So I think if that interests people, that's just something that they can do to sort of find classes a little bit more tuned in to the world perspective is all. I'm just gonna right. throw that out there. Right. right. Okay. For some reason I'm having a hard time doing a, a chat. Yeah. There it is. Thank you, Carrie. No problem. Dr. Murr, um, Monica Parker um, states that she teaches biology and thinks adding this would be such a wonderful addition. She asked if she could email you for some recommendations. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to. That'd be great. Anybody who wants uh, to contact me and you know, get my, I'll send you any material I have. It's tons. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your good questions and for your attention. Okay. Dr. Mario, thank you. Um, congratulations on being nominated um, for this year in the 2021 Last Lecture um, Series. And thank you so much for sharing today. Uh, definitely some inspiring stories and um, letting our students know that, hey, we can over overcome um, adversity. Absolutely. And, uh, thank you for sharing this with our students. My pleasure. Thank you all. Bye.